This is Mike from the One Stop Co-op Shop, and I'm finally completing the trifecta of the big releases from Chip Theory Games. This is a playthrough of Too Many Bones. Specifically, Chip Theory Games sent me a copy of Undertow, which was the standalone second release in the series. And I polled our Patreon supporters on which gear locks they wanted me to play with, and they actually picked in an overwhelming level both of the gear locks that come with the Undertow standalone set. So you're going to see basically everything that's in Undertow and nothing that is not included in it. We've got Duster, a sneaky sword fighter, with Nightshade, her wolf companion. And Stanza, a sort of battle bard who uses music and a bladed lutar to fight enemies. As usual with my playthroughs, I'm going to go through setting up the game and the basics of play, but if you already know all of that, feel free to use the timestamps in the video's info or in the pinned comment to skip right to the playthrough. And if you like what you see or any of the content here at One Stop Co-op Shop, feel free to subscribe or even consider supporting us on Patreon. So first you have to choose which gear locks and how many you'll play with. I like to play two-handed even when I'm playing solo, but the game does support single gear lock play and all the way up to four gear locks. For each gear lock, you're going to take their unique set of dice in a dice tray, as well as their quick reference sheet that goes through all the icons on their dice, all the dice available to them, special rules they use, and also even some suggested builds for them. And generally speaking, you're not going to start with any dice on your gear lock board, unless your character sheet lists dice that have a circle around them, like the nightshade die here, which means that Duster will start with that. And whenever you start with or gain a die, you just got to look for the little reference number in the upper left-hand corner, and you can place it in the matching number on your character sheet. Stanza also starts with one die, her Lutar die, that's going to control all of her magical music powers. You also need the character chips for each gear lock. Now, in Duster's case, she also has a chip for Nightshade, her wolf. But Sansa just has herself. You can put those on your character mat. And you put health chips under each gear lock's chip equal to their health value. So Stanza's going to have five, Duster's going to have three, and Nightshade's going to have two indicated right there. You also need your gear lock's initiative die. I like to just put them right on the chip. And to finish setting up your gear locks, you have to decide what level you want to play at. At the hardest level, Legendary Adventurer, you will just start as is. But I'll be honest that that level still tends to be a little bit too tough for me, so I'm going to go one down to Heroic Adventurer. And what that means is we each start with one free health upgrade. And what you do is you take these D6s from your character's dice tray and put them right next to there, so I get three plus one for health. And Stanza goes up to six health total. That'll be an extra health chip for each of them. And then additionally, we each get one free training. Now I'll save the details of how training works for the basics of play section. But Duster is going to choose her number one die, Duster's Dagger, which can bleed an enemy for consistent damage. And Stanza is going to choose one of her songs, Forever Mine, that lets her control enemy units and move with them. Next, you have to choose which tyrant you want to face. I'm going to go against Barnacle, which is a pretty quick one, just to kind of show you how the game works. So you take his card and his chip. And he's going to give you two key pieces of information on the front here. The number of days you have to complete this mission, and the number of progress you need to find his base and attack him directly. And one more key thing from the nemesis you choose, they're going to tell you which monster types you're going to build your supplies with. In this case, Barnacle is pretty simple. These are all three of the monster types that come in Undertow, so we just use everybody. Next, you're going to build your encounter deck. You have a whole bunch to shuffle together and a separate deck if you're playing solo with a single gear lock. In my case, I'm going to take six of them, two less than the number of days indicated on the Nemesis's card. And sorry, I'm calling him a Nemesis, but it's a Tyrant. You also will look to see how many Tyrant encounter cards your Tyrant has. In Barnacle's case, he has two, so I'm going to take both of those and shuffle them together with the six regular encounters I had. Finally, I'll find the four special encounters marked with a one-day symbol and the other four encounters marked with a two-day symbol. And I'll shuffle each separately and choose a random day one and day two encounter. Those will go on top of the shuffled deck. So in total, I'll have a day one encounter, a day two encounter, and then two less than the number of days regular encounters mixed with the tyrant encounters. And if you want to, they provide this little cover card with nice art on it to hide what encounter is coming until you want to see it. I set my little day counter here to day number one. And I divide and shuffle all my enemy, my baddie stacks. So I shuffle all the ones together. Again, I'm using all the ones from the Undertow box because Barnacle uses all three types. I do the same with the fives and the twenties. And then unique to Undertow, these were not in the core game, I shuffle the Krellin and Mech piles separately. They're each three-point baddies. 
I shuffle my loot and my trove loot deck separately, and I get my battle mat ready. Now you'll see more of this when we get to our first actual fight, but I have uh, this little round die with the R1 side showing. I have the four lane markers for baddies, each with their initiative die on top. And I have the four lockpicking dice, generic defense and attack dice, a regular D6, and some status effect dice on the side, ready to go. So with setup out of the way, let's get to the basics of play. So Too Many Bones is played over the course of a series of days. At the beginning of each day, except the first, you turn the day counter. Then you draw the top encounter of the deck, you can read the flavor text. And often you'll have a choice, though not always. Some choices will lead to battle, and some choices will lead to a non-battle resolution. If you successfully resolve the encounter, you gain the rewards indicated for the choice you made. Here it's loot, plus any rewards in the bottom left or right, so here it's some training points. And you also get to put the card underneath the Tyrant card, and any progress on the card will get you closer to the Tyrant's necessary progress, in this case 5, to fight him and win the mission. You need to reach that much progress and defeat the Tyrant before you get past the number of days indicated. Then, whether you won or lost the encounter, you get a chance to recover. You can trade loot around, try to lockpick trove loot, and then you can make one of three options. Resting to get your health back, searching for better loot where you trade in one of your pieces of loot and roll some dice and potentially get to draw other pieces to pick from. And finally, you can scout the area and see what baddies are coming up ahead based on a d6 roll. But the real star of the show here is combat encounters. That's what takes up the majority of the game time, uses all the cool dice and character abilities you have. And how each encounter works can vary drastically based on the encounter card you played. But I'll go through the basics quickly. So first to set up an encounter, most will say you spawn enemies equal to the BQ. And the standard value for that is equal to the day number multiplied by the number of gear locks in the party. So here it would be four since I have two gear locks. I don't count my wolf. Once you figure out how many points you're supposed to spawn, you take chips equal to that value from the highest baddie stacks you can out of one, five, and 20. So if it was four for day two, I would just have four ones in a stack. But if it was on to day three, three times two is six, so I would take a five, the biggest one I could, and then use a one to make up the difference. And the highest chips always go on top. You spawn enemies onto the battle board until you have four enemies, one for each of these markers, or until you run out of baddies in your queue. And baddies will show you right here in the bottom left whether they're a melee or ranged baddie, in this case they're melee. And that will control where they spawn. So if this guy was the first one to come out, the blue color, he would go on the blue melee space right there. And I give him as much health as indicated in the upper left underneath his chips. Additionally, you take the initiative die of the color matching their lane, you put it on the value indicated right here, this green one, and you put it on your initiative meter up here. If another baddie spawns later with the same value, they go after the other guy, but if they have more, of course they go before. Once you've spawned all your baddies, you get to place your gear locks on any of the gray circles that match their attack type. Now, in my case, both of us are melee type, but because we're on the raft side, there's also a uh, ground side on the other side. We can go on any of these spaces. So I could, for example, have both of us gang up on this guy. We also roll our initiative dice and put ourselves in the meter. If we tie with baddies, we can go before or after them. It's our choice. And then the rest of combat generally follows a pretty simple structure. Units will take turns from left to right in initiative. So here Stanza would go, and then Duster, and then the purple enemy, and then the blue enemy. And enemy turns are pretty basic. If they're a melee guy, they'll attack the closest gear lock. If they need to move to do so, because they can only attack orthogonally, they'll move up to two, again, moving orthogonally, and they can't move through any other chips. If they're a ranged attacker, they will never move by choice. They'll just sit there and plink people. And if there's ever a tie for who an enemy will attack, they'll tell you whether they attack the gear lock with the most health, the strength symbol, or the gear lock with the least health. And they have a bunch of keywords. You'll often have to look it up, but you'll learn them pretty quickly. Enemies will roll the number of dice indicated on the right. They'll only roll attack dice, the swords, if they have a target. So like if a melee guy doesn't get next to anyone, they won't roll that. And they'll roll the indicated number of defense dice unless they already have that many dice on them. So for example, if this guy rolled one shield in round one and put it on him and no one hit him, in round two he wouldn't roll any shield dice because he already has one shield die, the maximum he could roll. Generally speaking, when you or an enemy attacks, you roll the indicated number of attack dice, you deal that much damage. Any shields the target might have cancel out damage, one for one, whatever's left takes away health chips. If something gets down to zero health chips, they're removed from the board and their initiative die is taken away. And if you defeat all the enemies before all of your gear locks are defeated, you win the encounter, get the rewards. If you don't, you lose. Now to quickly run through what a gear lock can do on their turn, the key statistic is dexterity. So Stanza has three here. So first on her turn, she can choose to use as much dexterity as she wants. So let's say one to move one space for each dexterity spent. So that would get her within striking distance of this guy. 
The amount of dexterity she has left after moving, in this case two, is the number of dice maximum she can roll. And she can first roll basic attack or defense dice up to the value indicated. So here, with her two remaining dexterity, she could roll one attack die to deal damage and one defense die to protect herself. Kind of like the enemy's defense goes in the little active spot here and hangs out until it gets removed by damage. And pretty much every die in the game has this bone symbol. If you roll one of those, it goes into your backup plan. And these are little options you can use to do cool things. You can only use one of them per gear lock activation, though. But additionally, if a gear lock has skill dice, like the song Forever Mine that Stanza has, she could use that for one of her dexterity. So here she could, for example, attack one and cast Forever Mine. Now her songs are pretty unique. I won't get into all of those mechanics until we actually play. But generally speaking, after you roll a skill die, let's take a more normal one like Duster's Dagger. You can either choose to resolve its effect, like Duster making someone bleed, and then you exhaust the die so it goes to the left of your gear lock mat and can't be used for the rest of the battle. Or if you don't like the resolve, like oh crud, Duster rolled a bone with it, you can just put it back on your mat and it does nothing but you don't spend it. And a quick note on how training works when you gain training rewards. Your first option with one training point is to increase one of your basic stats by one. You just put a die in there, but you do have to roll for attack or defense to see if it's successful. And your other main option, which is always automatic, is to gain one of your skill dice to your board. If it's a starred spot, you can gain it freely, but if it has an arrow, you have to have one of the prerequisite skills before you can train it. All right, I think that's enough basics for now. You'll see how Duster and Stanza work as we go along. But let's get to our first encounter. So remember, we don't move the day counter the first day. We just resolve the first day encounter. Your move. Breathe. Chaos is everywhere. Guards, mechs, chaos, more mechs, more guards. Deep breath. It's time to move, but nothing could be more dangerous. The nearby surroundings are unknown, but there's a guard just up ahead with his back turned. A quick move, and anything he's holding could probably be stolen and put to good use. Maybe a few minutes to get the lay of the land would be beneficial, but the opportunity for extra wares will be lost. Deep breath. Time to move. Like with most encounters, we have a choice here. But do note that neither one is a combat choice, so the first day you're not going to have a combat encounter. So I can either find a lookout perch, which will get me an extra training, or I can pick some guards' pockets and get two loot. And every time you see the loot symbol, that's one for each character. So here I get two loot for Duster and two loot for Stanza. And the lookout perch one also lets me cycle through the baddies on the top of the stack, so kind of control who I'll fight the first match. And then regardless, since I'm going to succeed at this no matter what, I get one progress toward finding Barnacle and one loot for both Duster and Stanza. I tend to like training over loot, so I think I'm going to go with this option. So find a lookout perch. Reveal the first baddie from each baddie stack and cycle any to the bottom of the stacks if desired. And then if we cycle, reveal the next baddie. On top of the one stack is a kobold tenderfoot. He's got two life, pretty slow. Hardy means he can only take one damage per turn, so he'd be a little bit tougher to kill. Compound means his attack value is equal to the round, so the longer we wait on him, the tougher he gets. But I'm not too worried about him. Two hits and he's down, so I'll keep him on top. For the five, we've got a Goblin Artificer. Four life, pretty fast. Two attack. He's got equipment, which might give him bonus attack, health, or defense. And Mischief 2 takes away your active dice, like defense. But he's actually pretty easy to kill, because he doesn't have any defense dice himself, so I'll keep him. And finally, the value 20. We hope to never even see this guy. He's got 9 life. He makes us bleed if he attacks. He spawns an extra guy to help him out. He's got dodge, which means we can't hurt him with regular attacks. 4 attack, 2 defense. This guy's a monster. I'll put him on the bottom. And we get the goblin guru Toblin on top. But again, we're not going to get to 20s uh, in a shorter scenario like this, so I'm not worried about it. Now we get our other rewards. One training each, one loot each, and one progress. Progress goes right under barnacle. We're one-fifth of the way there. For the training for Stanza, she has pretty low dexterity, terrible attack and defense. I could get another song for her, but without going too much into the mechanics, uh, it's tough to use more than one song until you upgrade some other stuff. Could get one of her direct attack skills, like Axe Blade is a nice one. It does direct damage and also poisons enemies. Yeah, for her, I like that kind of thing. Let's go with that. For Duster, I could go defensive and get Bottled Smoke. That can make him untargetable for a whole round. I could start upgrading my wolf, who kind of has his own track. Promise of Prey lets me do double damage with him one time. Or honestly, I could just go super basic for right now and add a dexterity so I can move and use more dice each turn. Gain okay, a loot card for each of them. We have a plated skull. You can use it three times. You just rotate it to show. At the start of a round, you may place a one defense die in an active slot. It's not bad. And also tar, sap, and twine. You can either remove some wreckage during a water battle. Basically, when you're on the raft, enemies can attack your raft and potentially destroy it and make you lose the encounter right away. Or you can put an obstacle chip down during a land battle to try to slow some enemies up. 
Duster's got less life, so I'll give him the Plated Skull, and Stanza can have the Tar Sap and Twine. And that's because I'm going right into the recovery phase, where you can trade this stuff freely. Although each gear lock can only have four loot total. Now in the recovery phase, remember you have the option to regain health, scout ahead and see which monsters are coming, or trade in loot. We haven't fought yet, so no one needs to heal, but Duster can scout ahead. If you get a 1, 2, or 3, you can look at the top unrevealed level 1 baddie. 4, 5 lets you look at a level 5, and a 6 lets you look at a 20. And it is the first unrevealed down, so we already know about the Kobold. And let's see, a Dragon Biddy, only 3 life, fairly fast, but 1 attack die, and melee. Not to worry about him, they can both stay on top. I do have the option, though, whenever I scout, to take the guy I see and put him on the bottom so we don't fight them. Stanza, on the other hand, is not too impressed. She's going to look for better loot. How that works is you have to discard one loot you have. Then I roll six basic attack dice for every bone I get. I get to draw one loot card and keep one out of all the ones I draw. But if I'm unlucky enough to roll no bones, I just lose the loot and get nothing. But we got two. So we've got a single use and a single battle. Hearing Sensor reveal the top two cards of the encounter deck, place back on top of the deck in any order. Not too impressive. Krillin Caviar, heal yourself for one hit point at the start of each of your turns for the entire battle. That is definitely the winner. So that's it for day one. We're on to day two. And here's our day two encounter. Now that Obendar is safely in the pass, thoughts turn to the task of building a raft to navigate the Sibrin. Chopping down trees is tiring splinter getting work, but the sounds of loud quarreling nearby reveal a simpler option. A group of unsuspecting barbarians with piles of stolen resources strewn about their camp. Brick, lumber, grain, ore, and wool. So much wool! At the moment, the entire group is puzzling over how to build a catapult from two wood and three brick. Taking on the whole group is doable, but perhaps a little tough. If we make some subtle noises from the tree line, maybe we can lure a few of them away and search for a robber who might steal from their stash at random. Number one, we can distract them. So the baddie points will subtract one. Right now we're in day two, so that'd be three instead of four with the subtraction. We also have surprise, which means we'd automatically have the highest initiative. Or we can just fight all four points with initiative as normal. Then we'd each get a loot. If we win in any case, we'll get two training points. That's great. I have to hope we can handle four basic guys, so let's go for it. And important for Undertow, battles happen either on land or on the raft. So you'll see both options here have a little tree symbol, so this is going to be on the land side of things. So we set up the enemies first. Day two times two gear locks is four. We got the two guys we know about and two more, and they go from top bottom in the same order. Since the Kobold Tenderfoot is first, he'll get the blue one marker. And is two life, and as a melee guy, he'll go on the blue spot there. His initiative is a lowly two. Next, with the purple lane, three life, and melee also is a dragon biddy with four initiative. For number three, we have a minikin monkey, three life, four initiative. If he rolls at least one bone when he's attacking and defending, he becomes untargetable, which means he can't be hurt until his next turn. He's a ranged unit targeting the weakest person, one attack and one shield. Not great. He's going to go in the yellow range spot. And also for initiative, since he's tied with purple, he goes after him because they go in order. And last we have, oh, this guy sucks. He's only got one life, but he has six initiatives, so we have to get really lucky to go before him. And he has signal two. That means for the first two rounds of combat, until we kill him, he will add extra one-point baddies to the queue. So we'll have more guys spawning. And he's rain, so he's all the way back here. We can roll for our initiative before we decide where to place ourselves. Oh my gosh, Stanza, you are slow. But okay, a duster will go pretty quickly. So here, Duster has to go between green and purple. But Stanza can choose to go before or after blue. She'll go before. Now my Nightshade die that Duster started with is an initiative die that lets Nightshade join the battle. But he only comes in at the start of a battle if I'm already below my max health, which I'm not. Otherwise, at the end of any round where I don't have max health, he'll show up. Now Duster has an innate ability called Shadow Dweller. She's kind of a sneaky ninja, so she can start on any space. So I think she'll start right here to try to take out that goblin guy pretty quickly. Meanwhile, Stanza is a melee character, so she has to start on one of these four spots. And I think she'll be right in front of the uh, kobold so she can take out him before his attack grows too high. And Stanza has one more thing to do when she sets up. She rolls her Lutar die. Here I got a measly two. And just to kind of quickly go through how her songs work. If she wants to play a song like Forever Mine, she has to start on the first verse. This little one in the bottom right hand corner. And that's also how much focus it takes to play this song. So right now she's fine. Next round, she could choose to advance the song to its two value. Now she would need two focus. And the following round, if she wanted to advance it to the three value, clearly she couldn't because she doesn't have that much focus yet. Playing a song like that uses up one dexterity if it's on any of its verses. 
Now, in any round, instead of going to the next verse, you can choose to vamp the song, which does not use dexterity, but does use one focus. And then the following round, she can go back to the beginning of the song. She can't go to any other part of the uh, track. Alternatively, and this is where having multiple songs is nice, she can roll this as one of her dice and use the focus value that comes up. So it'd be one here in the bottom left or four here. And that'll be added to her Lutar die. So that's how she can play like bigger songs or get further along in songs. All right, so let's do round one. Green is first to act. Since he has signal two at the start of round one and two when he's acting, he'll add a one point baddie to the queue. Now this guy just basically hangs out until we defeat one of the baddies and clear out one of the colors because right now we have all four markers in use. And then at the end of the round where that happens, we'll spawn him as though he had just started in. And for anybody who's not a level 20 or the tyrant, he'll start at the bottom of the initiative track. He'll ignore his regular value. And then this guy's rolling his one attack and one defense. He's a ranged guy who targets the weakest gear lock, which is Duster in this case. And pretty standard result. One damage to Duster, one shield for him. I just put the shield right on him. And Duster takes one damage. All right, next up is Duster. Duster's got four dexterity, two attack, one defense, plus her dagger. Now, she could move, but she doesn't want to. She wants to take this guy out. So she'll roll all four of her dice. Hopefully, she'll roll enough attack that she won't need the dagger, and she can save it for later. Uh, but in this case, it was actually good. So she's going to deal one damage to the guy, which will take away his shield. And then she can choose to use this. This will put a bleed effect on the guy, which means he takes one damage at the start of his turn. And we get to choose in what order start of turn abilities resolve. So we can have the bleeding defeat him before he gets to uh, add another one-point baddie. Besides that, Duster gets one defense. And one bone. Her abilities really rely on having her wolf out, so that's not going to do anything for us yet. And we'll go ahead and exhaust the dagger die over here to the left. We can't use it for this battle anymore. But the one damage will take away this guy's shield, and then we put a one bleed effect on him. So again, he'll be dead before he ever gets to do anything else. Next up is purple, which is our dragon. He's a melee fighter, so he'll attack Duster since he's already next to him. Always want to go for the closest. He rolls a single attack die, and that's canceled by Duster's one defense, so they both go away. But the dragon does have the weaken one ability. That means Duster will only have three dexterity next turn instead of four, which isn't too big of a deal for her. But how they just won't leave her alone, this monkey is also shooting at Duster since it's a ranged attacker with weakest gear lock target. One attack and one defense, and a standard 1-1 one, one result. Monkey gets the defense. Duster has no more defense. He was down to two health. Yikes. And thank God, Stanza is up. So Stanza handles her song choices before she does anything else for her turn. So she'll go ahead and activate Forever Mine. And that's going to let her basically mind control a one-point baddie at any point during her turn. For her other two dexterity, because she doesn't want to move, she's going to use her Axe Blade and a regular attack. She's hoping to defeat this kobold straight out. I could use the song now, but I want to see how things go first. Oh, crud, a terrible result. So I could use this with two bones, but again, I'd much rather wait for some poison damage and regular damage. So I can choose not to use them, just put it back on my uh, sheet. So she just does one damage. So the Kobold's hardy means it can only take one damage total during any given turn. And that means even if I did something like had the uh, dragon attack him right now and also do a damage, it would not kill him off because it's all still Stanza's turn. I was hoping the poison would kill him because like bleeding, that would have activated the start of his turn, but no such luck. All right, Stanza still has forever mine to you. She's going to use it on the dragon. She can move him two spaces, and she's going to have the dragon attack the monkey. So she rolls the same dice as though the enemy was activating. In this case, two. Nice roll. So that takes away the monkey's shield and one of its three life. And the dragon weakens the monkey just like it weakened Duster. For enemies, though, that just means next round they have one less attack stat, so the monkey won't roll an attack at all, which is nice for us to keep uh, Duster alive. All right, last to activate is the Kobold, who is still alive. With his compound abilities, rolling attack dice equal to the round, which is only one. And, oh, nice. So he didn't do anything to uh, Stanza. I wish Duster was so lucky. All right, it's the end of the round. We cannot spawn this enemy yet because all four enemies are still on the board. But, ha ha ha, Duster has less than full life. So Nightshade is coming in. So Nightshade acts on its own initiative. And since it's coming in, it's going to be all the way at the top. It'll spawn into an empty gray space, just like a melee fighter. And each turn can move up to two spaces and then attack for two dice of damage. So in this case, let's uh, put him right there, ready to attack one of those guys. All right, we're going into round two. A quick little note, if you get all the way to round six or later, you get this fatigue symbol, and that means two things. Number one, all units can now move diagonally. 
And number two, at the start of every round, every unit on the board takes one damage, no matter what. It skips all defenses, all abilities, everything. So hopefully we won't get that far. All right, Nightshade is first. We know the Goblin is already dead from the bleeding, so Nightshade could either run up and maybe try to take out the Dragon with a lucky roll, or certainly take out the Kobold. Yeah, I think the Dragon's probably the best call. The Kobold should be pretty easy for anybody to defeat since uh, he goes last in order. All right, so two dice of attack, and does two damage, so the Dragon has one left. Next to act is our Goblin, and again, we can choose the order, so we choose to have him die immediately from the bleeding, and he's gone. His lane chip comes off, although it might be used by that one later. And so does his initiative die. And he goes in a little face-up defeated pile next to the ones. Hopefully we'll never get to him again because we won't go through the whole pile. All right, and with that, that means Duster is up. Remember, Duster would normally have four dexterity, but the weakness is making her have three. So she'll move right next to our kobold friend here. That leaves her with two dexterity left. She had a three from the weakness, one to move. Sure, we're one attack and one defense. We're taking a little bit of a chance of rolling a miss on the attack, but it's pretty good odds we will, there we go, hit. So one defense goes into her active slot, and the Kobold is also defeated. All right, next up is the Dragon attacking Nightshade, because they do target uh, him as well. One attack. Ha, ah, nothing, awesome. But unfortunately, the weakened effect still happens, so Nightshade will only roll one attack die next turn. All right, next is our Monkey. His one attack goes down to zero from the Dragon's weakening. But he does still roll the one defense since he lost it. Oh, crud. So he's getting very hard to hurt right now. All right, Stanza has three dexterity. She'll keep playing her song, but she'll also move up here and I think probably roll one to attack to defeat the dragon. So she could either vamp her song or advance to number two, which is her max focus right now. This would let her mind control up to a level three baddie, but she can still do a level one. So she can resolve her songs at any point during her turn. She'll have the dragon attack the monkey before she attacks the dragon. So here we go again, one damage. And he's also weakened, good luck attacking. And now she'll attack her target, the dragon. Oh, crud. So she just gets a bone. And I think she's actually gonna use it. Remember, you can use one of your backup plan bone abilities per turn. Tune up, which only costs her one bone, lets her move her focus value up one. So now she can keep playing her saw next turn. All right, speaking of the end of the round, we get to spawn our new baddie. And he has, ooh, a somewhat nasty one. Two life, but he has the dodge ability, which means you can't hurt him with attack dice. You have to use stuff like poison. Good thing Stanza has some. Uh, the four initiative won't matter. Remember, he's going to the back automatically. And he has one attack. And blind strike means at the start of his turn, he deals that much damage to the strongest adjacent unit, most health. That could be an enemy if you time it right. He's going to take the blue chip. They always prefer that. And he'll first try to be in the correct space, but it's occupied. And then he'll count up. So two and then three. So he's right there where we want him next to Stanza so she can uh, poison him. And he has last initiative. So after her, thankfully. And now we go on to round three. And we've got kind of awkward placement here. If Nightshade kills the dragon, Duster can't really get anywhere too useful. And he's also only rolling one attack this turn, which almost makes me think I move Nightshade away and have Duster run up and attack the dragon instead. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So let's move uh, Nightshade over here. And this will go away, even though uh, he didn't attack. Duster's at three dexterity again, so she'll run up and attack with two attack dice. Okay, ooh, and I also got a uh, backup plan. But the one will finish off the dragon, good. All right, the monkey's next. Once again, weakened and already has defense, so won't roll at all, just hangs out. All right, so we get to Stanza. From her backup plan bone ability, she has enough to go up to verse three and influence up to a level five baddie. She wants to kill this guy, so she's not going to move. And regular attacks won't affect him, so for her two dexterity, she'll roll one defense and her poisoning axe. Hopefully it works. Now before she rolls, she's going to have uh, the chimp acrobat attack the monkey. And when she uses her trance ability control guys, it says all of their skills are optional, so she doesn't have to activate blind strike, which would actually hit her. So she's going to roll one attack against that guy. One damage. So this takes away its shield. Now she'll roll her two dice, hoping for some poison. Yes! All right, so this is perfect. She'll do one damage, and it does get through because he only ignores regular attack dice. She'll get one defense. And she's going to put a two poison effect on him. What that means is at the start of this round, he'll take two damage that ignores defense. It's called true damage. And then it'll count down at the start of the next round. If he was still alive, he'd take one more. And once again, it's a thing of beauty. We can choose the order things resolve, so he'll die before he ever blind strikes her. So speaking of, he activates, immediately dies, never even got to do anything. Sorry, buddy. All right, now we're in round four. All right, so Nightshade sadly can't get to the monkey. I guess I'll go over here. Um, Duster, though, will move up. Even with the move, she's got three dexterity left. But just like enemies, she can't roll defense if she's already equal to her value. So she'll waste one dexterity and just roll a two attack. Ooh. Okay, so just one damage. That means this guy will still be alive, darn it. 
And none of these unfortunately helps. The one bone pack mentality lets Duster move Nightshade adjacent to her or vice versa. Backstab lets her deal two damage if her and the wolf are both next to somebody, not the case here. Crywolf deals two damage to Duster to make her invulnerable for a turn, which would be great if she had more than two health. So the monkey will get a final turn. Both Nightshade and Duster are equally weak, so the monkey will target Duster since she's closer. And oh my gosh. So because the monkey rolled a bone, he is hiding up in the trees, and we can't target him until after his next turn, which means we'll be getting into... Oh, no, I guess not. Stanza might be able to kill him. But he did deal one damage, which uh, Duster blocks. All right, Stanza unfortunately has to either vamp or get rid of this song. I think she'll just exhaust it. But that means it's not using any dexterity, so she can move up here, but she can't roll any attacks because she can't target anybody. The monkey is untargetable. All right, we're up to round five. Almost fatigue. Not good. So Nightshade's hanging out. Uh, Duster will try to get her defense back. Ah, darn it. Although, hey, actually, not all bad. For four bones, she'll go ahead and use this. She gets to make a fortunate discovery. All Gearlocks have uh, some consumable items they can choose from when they do this. In her case, she has Scrag Roots that can stop negative status effects from being placed on her, or Blade Dip that can add poison damage to irregular attacks. I tend to like Blade Dip first. Any roll? Yes, I got the better one. This goes on a locked slot for her. Basically, it stays between battles if it's locked and she gets to use it more often. All right, the monkey is back. Hopefully, he won't become untargetable again. Okay, he's still attacking Duster. You jerk. So Duster's actually down to one life. And the monkey is untargetable, so not much stanza can do. And then, crazy as it seems, we go into the fatigue round. Everybody takes one. And that defeats Duster. But happily, it also defeats the monkey, so the battle is over. And it's important to note that everybody's health stays the same, because remember, one of your options during recovery is to heal. And in Duster's case, she's going to have to heal, because she has no life left. But that can be a bummer, because she has to choose either to heal herself or Nightshade when she chooses that option. And a quick note that at the end of battle, all your skill dice go back, you'll be able to use them again. But any active dice go away, although as I noted, locked dice can stay around. Alright, that was an uglier one than it should have been, but we each get a loot, and we each get two training, lovely. And we're now two-fifths of the way to Barnacle. So two loot, we can pass it around. Ooh, fish dinner. Heal any gearlock for four hit points outside of battle. That's actually really great with uh, Duster and Nightshade working how they do. So I guess I'll give that to Duster. Ooh, and Spider Silk Salve. Place one health chip on this card during recovery each phase, each day. Uh, this hit might be used to heal yourself. This card when used. So it just kind of blows up. We can probably save it for the boss and get full healing. And even though we're about to train twice, let's go ahead and put that on for recovery. Now, for Duster training twice, this might be kind of crazy. But I like to get Promise of Prey, and then if you see the arrow, I can't get Ferocity until I have that. And what Ferocity does is each time I use it, I have a small chance, one-third, of leveling up my wolf for free. Although if I roll one of these Bones results, you'll see they're red. I have to use them. I can't save them and try again next round. So I'm kind of going a bit all in for Nightshade. We'll see how it works out. As for Stanza, first she's going to try to train Attack. Attack and defense are the only things that don't train automatically. You roll your current value. And for attack, if you get a bone, you have to choose something else. For defense, because bones are more common, if you get at least one bone result, you have to re-roll all the bones. And then if you still have any bones, you have to train something else. So let's try for attack. Good. So she's now up to two. Then I think she'll also get a dexterity. Let's get her kind of basics down before we uh, get more songs. My recovery phase, Stanza's only down one life, so I guess she could scout, but I think she's happy. And for Duster, I don't think I need my fish dinner yet. That would let me get Nightshade back to two life, but that's not too much of a gain. So she'll just use her regular recovery to get back to four life. Does mean, though, that she's not hurt, so Nightshade won't show up at the start of the next battle. Speaking of, let's get to day three. A crown surger carcass washes up on shore, reminding us that even the mightiest creatures in Daylor can succumb to the unpredictable hazards of the Sibrin. Of course, we didn't realize it was a carcass until we had stabbed it, poked it, and otherwise attempted to completely annihilate it first. Upon our keen detection of its deceased state, our competitive natures kick in. Recognizing a great feasting opportunity is hidden beneath a sickening amount of oily scales, blubber, and guts, the most strong-willed among us race to see who can fillet the most bones from the beast the fastest. Oh, so no combat this time. All right, knives ready. One, two, go. Simultaneously, each gearlock will roll and reroll their combined attack and defense dice as quickly as possible, keeping all bones as they are rolled. The first gearlock to get all their dice showing a bone is the winner. The winner gains five buff hit points. That's amazing. That's uh, basically extra hit points that just sit on your prep area here. 
and they have to be lost first before regular hit points. And all other gear locks gain two. So since it's me rolling against me here, I'll take away the timed aspect. Oh wow, Duster wins. That's kind of my preference that she has less life, but now she has five buff hit points before Nightshade will ever show up, which isn't so great. And stands against her too. And pretty dull card. Otherwise, one progress. We're at three now and one training. For Duster, I'm kind of torn. I could just boost her basics. Bottled Smoke is a great defense one. Infusion Bracers lets her hit somebody back when she gets hit. And then I can add on Micro EMP next time, which would take away an enemy's abilities, which can be pretty amazing. If I get both of those, I can get D cells, which will let either of these potentially stun an enemy missing their entire turn. Awesome combo if I get them all. Yeah, it might be stronger to go for basic stuff, but I like these kind of things. So let me get the infusion bracers. As for stanza, hmm. I think I should get one more dexterity before I get more songs. Because right now she has a three dice plus like her axe blade, that'd be four, plus keeping her song up, that'd be five. So yeah, that will let her potentially do everything on her turn and maybe move some too. And then I can more safely add another song that she would need another dex to keep up. We get another recovery option, so Nightshade is back to two health. Oh, and our Spider Silk Salve gets better. Stans is fully healed and likes her item, so she'll go ahead and scout. And she can see... Ooh, up to a 20, but again, we don't really care much about 20s. So let's see what the next number five is. I know this goblin we're about to probably fight. Hmm, six life. Mischief one is not bad at all. Oh, but he hits two guys in range. Yeah, forget you. Get out of here. All right, day four. Remember, we have eight maximum. We already have three out of five progress, although we don't have to fight Barnacle right away. Our gaze locks onto the harrowing rapids up ahead. We're about to pay the toll of the crushing waters, either in painful wounds or a night's worth of rap repairs. As the river rushes onward, all we can do is shift position and paddle full force into the breach. With mobility and planning, maybe we can weather the storm. A group of starving apes leer from the shore, likely hoping for some free loot or a meal to wash up downstream. Neither plowing through the rapids nor portaging past hungry wildlife sounds enticing, but we must decide before the current decides for us. All right, so this is a water or land choice, both combat. So for water, we have our regular batty points, which is eight, but it would include two of the Krellin, who are three each. So basically it'd be six from them plus two one-pointers. And they're kind of interesting in that they like sort of sit next to the raft, and if they don't attack us, they can't move on to land. Instead, they'll try to destroy the raft and cause wreckage. And so let's see, at the ends of rounds, one, three, and five, slide all non crawling units to the rightmost positions. We all slide, that's fun. At ends of round two, four, and every fatigue round, shift all units on the raft to the leftmost position. That's awesome, I like that a lot. Okay, or apes over sharp teeth, please. So I have the regular baddie points, but I use only apes to create the BQ before using other baddies. I'm going to show you what a raft battle looks like, so let's do that one. Right, so we flip to our raft side. Remember, we're building up to eight baddie Q. We have two of the crown. Then we need a two ones to finish off, and the crown always go on top. So we're going to spawn them like before. Okay, blue is a crown water wraith. Four life, yuck, can poison us one and hits two of us, but only in melee, so we can probably prevent that. And for crown, you roll a d6. And that's the spot they go to, and then they'll count up if uh, that's already occupied. Next, we have a Kreln Lure, and he attacks you. You have to exhaust one of your dice. That's what Shock does. And he's going to three. I'm sorry, I should have said three initiative and four initiative, respectively. For our yellow baddie, another one of our dragon friends. Four initiative, so after purple. And melee yellow goes right there. Finally, ah, this jerk. We got the signal guy again. All the way at the front of initiative. He's at ranged green next to the dragon. And don't forget, at the end of the first round, we're all going to slide to the right. End of the second round, all to the left. It'll just be kind of goofy insanity. Okay, let's roll for our initiative. Remember, Nightshade can't come in yet. Oh, yes, Duster. Only had one six on her dice, but now she can kill that goblin before anybody ever gets called. And sure, we'll have Stanza go before them. All right, so Duster can go anywhere, but I guess it's right next to this guy would be fine. And Stanza, I think, can focus on the dragon for now. I'd like us to both gang up on one of these guys at a time if we can make it work out. All right, Duster is first. Uh, four dexterity, so I guess two attack and one defense. And then she can roll for us even before Nightshade is on the mat. If she gets the level up symbol, she can lock it as many battles as she needs to until Nightshade actually shows up, and then she can use it to level him. So I'll make that my fourth. One damage will kill this guy. Hopefully I get it. Oh, way more. Ah, but that wasn't great. That has to go there. Two defense is nice. And then three damage, of course, takes this guy out before he has a chance to signal anybody. All right, so then Stanzo's next. Actually, you know, I'm realizing she has a pretty decent chance of killing this guy straight up by herself. Should have started her there, but I will say it's too late. 
You got five dexterity there, so she could run up next to the guy for one dexterity and then use her axe blade and both her attack and even get her defense in. Or ooh, if she doesn't want to use defense, she can play forever mine and have the dragon help her kill the guy. That sounds like a plan. So she'll play that. I gotta roll my Lutar. I've got a four this time, more than enough. So that's one of her five dexterity. That's two. And then three, four, five will be some focused attacking. So let's have our dragon friend come over and attack the guy first. So one die. Darn it. Does still weaken him though, so he won't have any attack, but his poison will still affect me. Of course, that's only if he's alive. Come on, Lutar! Darn it. That was literally not great. So that's one damage plus one poison, so that'll be two damage. Three damage, he'll have one life left. Ah, the bones. I could choose not to use the result, but ah, what the hey. So one damage to the guy, one poison. Oh, sorry, actually two damage. I forgot that my uh, axe blade also did one regular damage. And let's see the Krellin lore. Oh, crud, I forgot. If there's nobody for them to attack, they move to the next higher place, which means he's going to attack Stanza. So his shock one makes her get rid of one skill die in her skill area. Nice thing for me is with the axe blade gone, I don't have any. But he's still rolling two attack dice, and she has no defense. So there goes all of her buff hit points. She's back to normal. And next, the uh, dragon will attack her as well. One die of damage, one, and then she's weakened. Not having a great day. And our friend here takes one damage from my poison, but then it's gone. He's not rolling any attack dice. But he does poison her for one. And we are sliding down the rapids. Not too much movement on that one, but next turn we could really move. Round two. Let's have Duster try to take out this nasty guy. That leaves her with two dexterity. I think bleeding knife and regular attack makes the most sense. Ah, oh, come on. Yeah, I guess I won't use that. I'll just deal the one damage. That was pretty ugly. Meanwhile, Stans will only have four dexterity this turn, and she takes one damage from the poison. But that means she can still keep her song going and do two attack and one defense. And her song advances to verse two, which means she can affect a Krellin. So before she attacks, let's have this shock guy try to kill the poison guy. His two dice have a good chance. Yes. Bye-bye, fish. Fight amongst yourselves. Now for her actual turn, she'll try to hit the shock guy next to her. Oh, did she really do it? <laughs> she took him out with a lucky attack roll. And she did get a second bone. That doesn't let her do anything except increase her focus, which she doesn't need yet. Okay, the dragon's hitting her for one. One damage done. She's down to three. This means Duster still has her ridiculous amount of buff hit points, which means Nightshade's pretty much never coming out. And she is weak in one. Round three is up. Gosh, I don't know Duster. Oh, that's right. We all get washed. Duster can use three out of four dexterity. Try to bleed the guy. There we go. So that'll be one damage every turn. Stanza can try to control him, but there's no one for him to attack and nowhere for him to move. So she'll just do her basic dice. Oh, more than enough. He is gone. All right, so Duster never got hit. Uh, Stanza will be able to heal pretty easily. Getting one loot and one training each. And we're one progress away from being able to attack Barnacle, although, again, we could wait all the way until eight days. Okay, loot each. Programmable defibrillator. During battle, use on another KO'd gear. I like to provide them with three HP. Or if you are KO'd, provide with two HP. It would permanently reduce revive gear lock's health stat by one. Oof. And this one's pretty cool. Increase your dexterity by two this turn. If you reduce the hit points of a mech, then this loot is not discarded, maybe used again. So I guess I'll give that to Duster, who needs dexterity more, and uh, Stanza can have the defibrillator. Spider Silk is up to three. Stanza's gonna go ahead and heal to recover. And Duster will scout, I guess. I will do another five. Theoretically, our next day will be two fives. Yuck. Two defense, seven life, weaken two, three attack. Nope, bye bye. All right, we're on to day five. It's hopeless. The rain won't stop, the waves won't relent, the Sibrin won't narrow, and our strength won't hold. We're going under if drastic measures are not taken. The raft is simply supporting too much weight, and short of throwing some gear overboard, there's simply no hope for survival. Swallowing the briny Sibrin water between shouts, we scream at each other to only throw away our least important wares. The next day will be hard, but at least we'll live to tell the tale. Man, another no combat, but it sounds like a bad one. Downsize or capsize? The weight your raft can support is equal to today's baddie points. Calculate total weight of party as follows. Loot and trove, loot equals one. Yeah, like we each have three, so that's six already. Each hit point equals one? I mean, God, just Duster and crew. Duster has four plus five temporary hit points plus the two from Nightshade, that's 11. And then Stanza has six more, so that's 17 plus six from our loot, 23. Each skill die on Matt equals one? Oh, and then, of course, we have no recovery phase today, <laughs> so we can't even, like, heal the damage, and we'd have to fight next turn without any of our stuff. Okay, Lord, Lord, Lord. I'm definitely going to throw away all the buff hit points, because I want Duster to bring out Nightshade. And I have the fish dinner to heal us. 
Holy crap, the encounter says hit points discarded aren't available for use in the next battle, so I can't even, like, heal into them with the fish. Uh, let's see, I don't need Promise of Prey, I don't need the Infusion Bracers, I can exhaust both of those. I guess I can just get rid of her songs entirely for next battle. So what's that leave us out skill point-wise? Uh, these don't count as skill dice consumables. We've got three between us. And which loot do we care most about? Malfunctioning mech I can get rid of. The Fibrillator hopefully won't need. Uh, fish Stern is only outside of combat. And Plated Skull. Uh, yeah, the only ones I really care about are Spider Silk Sav and Krellen Caviar. The one hit point every turn is pretty nice. And this is a huge heal to bring somebody back from the brink. I, mean, I guess I can ditch Ferocity. I only have a one-third chance of it working anyway, although I hate doing that. If I ditch the Nightshade died, I can afford to get rid of both of his hit points as well. So what's that leave me at? One, two, three. So I could have seven hit points between us. So let's get rid of one from Duster and two from Stanza. All right, there we go. Yuck. But hey, we do get two progress, more than we need, and two training. Clearly that we're not fighting the boss this next round. For the training, I think Duster needs plus one dexterity and plus one health. I can get the micro EMPs and D cells later. What the hey, for Stanza, let's get a little goofy. We'll get her charge swing, which can hit one guy for that much damage, then an adjacent baddie for that much. And then Fury Cleave, which is true damage cutting through all defenses and abilities. All right, we do have enough progress to fight Barnacle, but we'll wait a day. Now would be an awesome time to draw a non-combat encounter. While scouting for a defendable place to make camp, a shaft from one of our party leads us to a pile of dead trees. The semi-hidden and weathered carving of a Molnor crest says these aren't ordinary trees, so we set to work clearing them. Sure enough, we've stumbled upon one of their main drop sites for smuggled loot. The variety's impressive, but a twig snap reveals that this was not unguarded. As well-armed sentries approach, our hearts begin to pound. The loot we're standing in would quickly even the odds of this battle, but the second we use these discoveries, any chance of proving our innocence is lost. All right, now hold on, we can explain. So land battle, uh, baddie points, that would be 12. Add number five point baddies equal to party size, so 22, what? Build a Monor loot cache by placing loot equal to party size times three into a face-up stack next to the battle mat. Molnor loot cache is available for all Gearlocks to use and load into their loot area after battle. Right, if we do not use any of the loot, we get a positive Molnor encounter shuffled into the deck. If we use any of it or get it after the battle, we get a negative encounter. But we have to defeat them. I can't see how we can defeat these guys. And I guess we'll play this out, even though we clearly have no chance. Okay, that was a route. I wish I would kept more of my loot. I feel dumb for, like, trying to make things work. Since these guys weren't defeated, they all go back to the bottom of their pile. So no rewards, but thankfully we do get recovery, so Spider Silk is up to four. And Nightshade does go to one health, so we'll be able to use him. Uh, Duster's gonna recover up to five. Stance is gonna recover up to six. And big thing, they get all their dice back, thank God. So we're going into day seven. The big question is, do we fight the boss now, or do we go for a 14-point fight? I didn't really get to level up all the way I wanted to. Uh, Stan doesn't even have another song, and Duster doesn't even have uh, any level ups for her wolf. But I didn't want to have like something bad happen in the next encounter and make us really poorly set up for the boss. So let's just go for it. So we flip Barnacle over. All right, so there's a water battle, as you can imagine, the title bout. So we're going to place tentacles one through four in Krellen's starting positions. And since we're a party of two, we'll have two more tentacles waiting in the battle queue. And then Barnacle, the actual boss, will be on the bottom. Now, tentacles after round one are placed on the bottom of the initiative meter. Tentacles don't roll the tyrant die. Each tyrant has their own unique die they'll roll when they activate. We have to defeat Barnacle to win. But Barnacle's key skill to the deep. At the end of each round, if Barnacle's on the battle mat and there are still tentacles in the battle queue, Barnacle will leave the battle to the bottom of the battle queue and it'll heal completely. And that mainly happens through recuperate. We throw an injured tentacle from the battle map and put it back in the BQ. So key thing for this battle is if we attack a tentacle, we got to finish it off before Barnacle's on the board to heal it and then uh, run away and heal himself. All right, the tentacles are in order and they get progressively nastier. So we're just rolling the first four and they're all going on the outskirts. Tentacle one's easy as anything, just one life, one attack, nothing else. Tentacle two has submerge, which means uh, instead of moving to the next higher number when we're not adjacent to it, it will roll for where it moves and might damage the uh, raft because of that. But it's also careless, so it might hurt itself. Only two life and one attack. Still not too bad. Tentacle 3 has three life. Also careless, has a bit better stats. And Tentacle 4 is where we truly begin to get nasty. 
Uh, four life, two attack, one defense, and that thing that will take away one of our skill dice on our board. Going on three. Now, I didn't explain wrath damage. Let's do that now. Anytime a crone can't attack, it'll move to the next higher number unless it has submerge. If it still can't attack us, it'll attack one of the adjacent empty wrath spaces. You roll its attack, and if it rolls at least one hit, it places a wreckage token on it. That now costs one extra dexterity to move into, and if you have all four of them on the raft already and would get a fifth one, you immediately lose the encounter, which in this case means I'd have one more day to try again, because uh, you do get all the way till your eight days, so I could fight this boss one more time. By the way, sorry, I should have said, I'm going to give the Krellin Caviar to Duster, since uh, she has less life. The Spider Silk Sab will be better for Stanza, who has more life and can thus uh, stand to take four damage and then heal herself. And Duster's going to go in and use it, which means at the start of each of her turns, she'll heal one damage. All right, initiative. Both three, huh. All right, so we'll clearly go after green. We'll go before all the other things. So green's going to go from three to four. I'd rather not get hit for the shock. Now let's roll for the Lutar. Oh, the crud, you know, I just realized. I don't think Forever Mine even affects them, because they aren't technically baddies with point values. So, okay. I guess uh, she's just not going to worry about playing music. Which does mean that she's fine to take one shock, because she'll just get rid of Forever Mine and won't have any effect. Ooh, actually, she should... Yes. Look, look, look. This guy's going to move to four before her. So if she's, like, right here and then moves up to attack either of these guys, she can use her shock axe, do a little bit of damage to the person in front of her, and probably seriously injure this guy. And then Duster can probably come in and kill it. All right, so with that in mind, she'll go here to try to kill that one. And Duster will be right there. All right, green uh, can't hit anybody. Moves over here. Still can't hit anybody. Holds its attack dice against the ship. And does hit, ooh, but no defense, I like that. So we get a wreckage, we'll put it right there so Duster doesn't have to move further. All right, Stanza will use two dexterity, she has three left. And it's a bit of a risk, but she'll use these three on average results. Oh, wait, how many bones does that have? It only has one bone side, come on, come on. Okay, good, she did three damage to kill the guy. Oh, look, only one damage to the guy next to him. That was not as good as I hoped. So one damage to him, but she does uh, kill the other big tentacle all at once. Let's see, Duster has five dexterity. Could move one here. Hmm. Two attack probably won't cut it. With her dagger, she would probably finish him off. Well, let's see, I'm going to do a few things. I'm actually going to roll two attack dice, my dagger, and my bracers. Between all those, hopefully something will die. That's not ideal. So one damage and bleeding would mean it would not die this turn. Could I actually save the bleed and maybe my wolf could get lucky and finish him off? Assuming I get hurt. So yeah, let's just lock these in. So that's one damage to him. I'm going to save my dagger maybe for the boss. All right, blue goes all the way to three. Pulls one to attack the ship. Uh, I hope he misses. Darn it. That's not great. Okay, and then purples attack in Duster. This is one die. I would love a damage here. Yes. All right, that's exactly enough to get my wolf in going before anybody else. Let's see, I could use my bracers to just kill this guy. Hmm. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Because with two tentacles dead, we'll perfectly get the last two in, but not the boss yet, because we'd like to kill him all before he's here. Speaking of, I got my wolf coming in. First, let's see what these tentacles look like. Okay, five, Jesus. Eight life, three and two, poison two, shock one. Are you kidding me? Oh wait, that was definitely tentacle eight. That's the worst one, I went out of order. Okay, yes, that is less horrifying. The submerge is problematic because he could just blow up the raft if we don't get next to him. And then number six can poison two and, oh, can attack two people if we're both next. And then coming in at five, uh-oh. Okay. Don't forget they're both at the back of the initiative. We'll sit at the front. Only has one life. Probably won't last very long. All right, probably a terrible mistake, but I'm going to have the wolf move in and try to finish off the shock guy. Just need two damage. Come on. Yes. All right, so beautiful. We're down to three tentacles. Okay, so now that means Stanza and Duster both go one after the other. Can we do six damage? Well, let's see. Stanza will clearly use her two attack and one defense. She's got two dexterity left. Let's go ahead and use just her axe blade. Well, what the heck? I have enough dexterity. Let's roll Fury Cleave, and then I can pick and choose to use them as I like. All right. 
That'd be three damage from that one thing. And another three. Oh, so he'll be dead when his turn starts. Awesome. So let's uh, save the uh, Fury Cleave. Let's clarify this guy's taking four damage. And he's got a two poison on him, so he'll die at the start of his turn. All right, now for Duster. Heals one, back to five. I could go one, two, three, four. That would leave me with one dexterity left. That'd be enough to probably kill that tentacle, and I can just tank two attack damage from that guy so he doesn't blow up the uh, raft further. Or I could just chill here. This guy's going to come over to me and attack me. If I just get some defense, I should be fine. Although, you know, actually, I do want to use the one bone I got to use pack mentality. I can move Nightshade adjacent to me so that uh, he won't just get killed by somebody. Oh, and if I stay put and kind of take a turn, I can use a Promise of Prey. That lets Nightshade deal double damage and move adjacent to somebody for free, so I could do it on that guy. If Nightshade survives, because the boss is going to come in and probably hit him. But yeah, what the heck? Okay, so I'll just roll uh, two of these and one defense and uh, not use uh, some of my dexterity. Actually, you know, I'll move down here. I don't want to get hit by Tentacle 5. Oh, yuck. Okay, so not training Nightshade. But I do have the Promise of Prey, so I can lock that and save it for the boss. But I'm pretty sure I wanted to hit that guy. Another bone, no defense. If Nightshade survives, I can use a Backstab to deal 2 damage. That would be nice. All right, so Blue comes over here, attacks me for 1 die. Uh, 1, but I'll heal at the start of my turn. Purple has submerged, so he's going to move to a random spot. Uh, six wraps up to one. Going to attack there. Also rolls his defense. Let's hope for not too high. Ah, crud. Okay. And yellow immediately dies. Bye-bye. All right, Barnacle pops in. One attack, one defense, plus his tyrant die. And he is a Krellin, so he's going to warp in somewhere as well. Oh, crud, I just realized if I roll the wrong number, we just lose. If he rolls a hit, because he can get our... Oh, no, no, hold on, never mind. We only have uh, three of these on the board, so we can take one more. But yes, he does go straight to the front, because he's a tyrant. Oh, and sorry, we're on round three, aren't we? Okay, so where does he come in? Six? Oh, okay, I guess he is next to us. That's good, probably. And we're hoping he doesn't roll the heart symbol, because the other one will just withdraw a wounded tentacle, but there aren't any. This one will place somebody on a water space, so will have to waste dexterity moving off of it. All right, he's attacking uh, Stanza, and she's the strongest. Okay, good. No effect. Oh, no effect for the attack. Just got one defense. That was a beautiful roll. All right, it's Nightshade's turn. I mean, got to use this ability, I guess, right? Yeah, because I don't think we have enough great abilities left to just kill this guy straight up. So we can move Nightshade directly adjacent to him. Oh, yes! Damage is doubled, so that is six, baby. So that's three shields and three damage down to two. Only, uh, and that's uh, a gone, of course. All right, Stanza's turn. I don't want to kill that weak tentacle, but if Duster runs over to help Nightshade finish that guy off, uh, she can't reach him. So what the heck, she'll just go ahead and use a Fury Cleave and two attack. Can't roll defense because she already has it, although she could drop it to try to roll better. Oh, give me a break. Okay, I'll put that back. But two damage gets rid of that and one of his eight. All right, Duster doesn't want to leave that guy injured. So we're one bone for pack mentality teleports adjacent to Nightshade. And we really need to kill this guy. So I'll roll two attack, bleeding, and a defense. Leave one dexterity out. Okay. Wow. All right. We need to use the bleeding, unfortunately. So that's one. One damage. So we don't even need the bleeding effect. This guy's dead. So we only got one tentacle left. It's not injured. Uh, it is going to go over to here and then try to attack the deck. And it does. So, wow, I mean, we're pretty close. We'll probably easily kill that, of course, uh, but we can never let Barnacle get a chance to attack. Okay, round four. Okay, Barnacle's first. All right, so does use this power. And it says the strongest gear lock adjacent to a tentacle. None are adjacent to tentacles, so nothing happens. So this one damage blocked by her shield and one shield on himself. Thank God he's pretty weak by himself. All right, Nightshade will start working his way back over to the boss. Sans will do two attacks. Let's try for a Fury Cleave again. Uh, let's see. I got a one-third chance of a two. I will save it. Ooh, but three damage. That's great. So one shield and two more. Okay, and very important, or we probably lose. Got to move Duster down. And just a two attack and the defense. Okay, and got the one we needed plus the defense. So no more tentacles. You're all alone, buddy. But we are getting very close to fatigue, and we won't live too long with that. 
I should say Duster should have gotten back up to five health a while ago. Okay, I'm not going to roll Barnacle's Tyrant die anymore because it only affects Tentacles and there aren't any. Uh, no defense, love that. Just uh, one damage to Stanza. Okay, Nightshade won't get to him yet, but oh, we can use one bone to teleport Duster over there now. That's nice. For Stanza, is going to try again. Okay, should we keep the one damage? Now, why not? I think this guy's going to be dead in 10 seconds. Yeah, for Duster's turn, I can use Pack Mentality to teleport next to Nightshade. I can't make change, and I have to use the leftmost dice so that a double one goes away. But we teleport over. And hey, I almost forgot all about this, but I've got two Poison Dip uses. I'll go ahead and use one. And what this means is I roll my attack. If I roll any bones, the poison doesn't work. But if I roll all hits, I place as much poison on him as dice I rolled. Actually, with that in mind, if I hit with both dice, he's dead anyway. So let's have a bit of fun and just roll a single die. <laughs> nice. So that's one damage. Oh, and darn, you know, he's not even going to get killed by the poison. He's going to get killed by the fatigue first. Because we're at our first fatigue round, which means my wolf is defeated. Oh, I'm sorry. Brought along some uh, wreckage with her. Duster goes down to four. Uh, Sansa goes down to four. But you are defeated, Tyrant. Take that. So there we go. Too many bones. One on day seven. And it looked like a pretty easy win, but don't forget, if even a single other hit had come on the boat, we would have immediately lost. Check out my review on this game and the series in general, see what I think. Good gaming, and we'll see you at the next stop.